Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, indeed, we come before you. We want to thank you. Thank you for calling all of us here together on this Palm Sunday, Lord. Lord, once again, as we remember your journey to Jerusalem, may your word speak unto us. May the Holy Spirit, Lord, plant seeds into our hearts. So indeed, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing unto you, for you are our Lord and our Redeemer. For we pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A very good afternoon, church. And uh, it's joy for me to share the Word of God with everyone here today. So the good news is, I have my scripts. <laughs> and the bad news is, also, I have my scripts. And it doesn't look short. It's quite long, so it will be a longer sermon than the previous one. Now, I just want to begin by thanking uh, everyone for showing grace uh, when I was preaching without script a few weeks ago. Uh, I have received uh, numerous encouraging messages from some of you, which I'm really grateful for. And a good sister in Christ of mine aptly reminded me of my role as the messenger of Christ. And hence, she said, what comes from God shall not return to him void. Okay. So I do believe that there are takeaways that God has given to me, uh, to all of us, uh, through me, to all of us from the sermon. And I hope uh, that, you know, the takeaway at least won't be the fact that pastor like trust you power. You know? <laughs> but anyway, let me just jump quickly into my sermon. So today we are taking a break from our current series on the Sermon on the Mount. And we are looking at the uh, last week of Jesus' life on earth. That begins with a triumphant entry, which is the passage that we are looking at today, and end with Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, I want to begin by saying that Palm Sunday, which is what we are celebrating today, was my third favorite uh, uh, Christian celebration, beside Christmas, obviously, and Easter, again, obviously. So that was when I was young. So this is the third one, okay? And I remember loving how the church was decorated with palm branches such as this, okay? And we get to hold the branches and reenact the scene of Jesus coming to Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, I always remember during the reenactment, all of us, meaning the Sunday school kids, they were, all of us wanted to be a part of the crowds, right? Because we get to wave the palm branches and later we got to sword fight with it. So I want to be a part of the crowd. And maybe, maybe a few gung-ho ones, they want to be Jesus. No, I want to be Jesus, you know. But certainly, no one wants to be a donkey. And remember that. But let me tell you this. Ever since I did more reading and more research into the account of Jesus' triumphant entry, I have then since changed my mind. I realized that the heading triumphant entry should be changed to triumphant entry with a big question mark on it. Because the event, while portrayed as a straight-up celebration of the coming of the king, is certainly more than meets the eye, as it fits directly into Jesus' fulfillment of the Messiah that is not triumphant, but as suffering, not as high and mighty, but as lowly and meek. And it is on this day, as he entered into Jerusalem, that the path of Calvary, the path of the cross, is set into motion. Now, let me just begin by setting the table, so to speak, by giving us a little bit of context and background to the passage. Now, there are three things that we need to take note of before we move on to the main points of the sermon. And the first thing is this, that this event, the triumphant entry, was recorded in all four Gospels, in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, signifying the importance of the event. You know, I was... Uh, I remember I was watching this uh, movie, it's called Across the Spider-Verse with my kids. Kids, how many of you know this movie called Across the Spider-Verse? And, uh, and ever since that movie, I don't know how many of you watched that movie, my son has been using this term called Canon Event. He said, that, oh, this is Canon Event. And Canon Event means major, important, and unchanging life events that happen to you that you cannot change, right? And ever since then, he always asks, like, so daddy, is our Korean trip Canon? like canon event, like I, I don't know, do you want to make it canon? It's up to you, right? Yeah, so what I want to say is this, this one, this event, because it was recorded in all four Gospels and how important it is, it is the start of Jesus' last week into Jerusalem and into Calvary. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this one and kids, okay, canon event. This is a canon event, okay? Now the second thing that we can look at, and this might be a bit 
of a seg uh, segue, okay? But it is still fascinating to look at, and you know, I have a little bit of personal bias on this because you know, I had an opportunity to, to go to Israel uh, last year. And you know, when, when you're reading about it, but, uh, and then when you were there, you know, it all comes together. So, you know, I just want to take just a few minutes to, to, to share a little bit. So it's, it's, good, it's good knowledge for us, okay? So I just want to share this, okay? When you look at how Jesus entered, looking at the geography uh, of, of Jerusalem, Jesus most likely entered Jerusalem through this gate called the Golden Gate. Can I have the picture of the Golden Gate there? It's called the Golden Gate. Now, there are about seven gates in the old city, and the eighth one, which is this one, the Golden Gate, is shut, okay? Now, there are a few theories of why it was shut, okay? It was shut by Sultan Suleiman of the Ottoman Empire. Now, one of the reasons why it was shut, people say it, was because of tactical reason, meaning that it was shut to prevent enemies from entering the gate. But the most prevalent or the most accepted reason why that gate was shut was when Sultan Suleiman heard the story of this particular passage that Jesus, the Messiah, had come through the gate Okay, note, okay, there are also Jesus in the Quran, so he know uh, well who Jesus is, right? What he did was he shut it, he shut it to prevent false Messiah or Antichrist from coming into the gate. So just, just a little bit of nuggets of information for you, okay? Now the Golden Gate is directly overlooking the Mount of Olive. So across from it is the Mount of Olive, and it was only separated by a valley called the Kijan Valley, okay? And Kijan Valley... If you look at from the picture, I, I, I'm not too sure whether you can make it out from here because I don't think that's, that's very clear, okay? But Kijan Valley was basically filled with Jewish mass grave, about 150,000 grave, okay? Again, you know, there are maybe some sort of implication to the grave. We would love to go there, but again, not the point of the sermon. So, but what I wanted to say is this. So basically, if you're looking at the geography of the place, you're wondering like, where would Jesus enter and all that? Basically, Jesus walked from the Mount of Olive, which is right across from that gate that you see there, through that Kidron Valley that you see there. At that time, there was no mass grave, of course. Through the Kidron Valley and into the Golden Gate. Okay, so that's, that's just a side note for everyone. Okay, now, Speaking of prophecies, there are about 200 prophecies about Jesus in the Bible that has been fulfilled, and many more that will be fulfilled when he comes again the second time. But one of the biggest prophecies that he fulfilled was in verse 15, where it says, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's coat. And verse 15 is, of course, a direct prophecy, verbatim almost, of Zechariah 9 9, right? Now, here's something interesting. If you look at Zechariah 9 contextually, I am not going to show it here, but if you want to, you can turn to Zechariah 9, right? And if you look at it contextually, it can be said that most scholars agree that verse 1 to 8 before verse 9, verse 1 to 8, uh, before verse 9, right, is actually a prophecy about another conqueror that we are all very familiar with and his name is Alexander the Great. Okay? Now, to be more specific, this is Zechariah's prophecy on the destructions of Israel's enemies by Alexander the Great. Now, so accurate was this prophecy that there are some scholars who thought that Zechariah wrote this after the fact. Right? Meaning that there are some scholars who thought that Zechariah lived after the time of Alexander the Great. So he was actually writing history, not prophecy. But that could not be further from the truth. Because historical records stated that Zechariah lived a good 150 years before Alexander the Great. Okay? Zechariah's timeline is 520 BC and Alexander the Great timeline is 365 BC. So about 150 years difference. Right? So verse 1 to 8 depicted the conquest of one of the greatest king, one of the greatest general, one of the greatest conqueror in the history of mankind. And he gave us a picture of the march of the greatest military might in the world under Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great represents power. He represents might. He represents victory. He's a conqueror, liberator, and even saviour. But then, then, the turning point, in verse 8, 
Zechariah prophesied on the coming of another king, but one that is very different from Alexander the Great. And this is what it says in verse 9, and we have read it together as a call to worship. In verse 9 of Zechariah chapter 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I think my slides uh, should be trying to catch up with me in a little while. I think you can just click. Yes. Uh, I think you can click some more. Okay, click some more. Ah, yes. Okay, you can stop there. So, it is as if Zechariah deliberately contrasted the two kings side by side. One comes to rule and to conquer, while the other comes to serve and to save. Both are saviors, but of a very different kind. As we can see from the passage. Now, let me just move on quickly to the sermon proper after all the background, all the setting the table, okay? Now, I want to start by showing you two pictures that some of you might recognize from when you were young. I don't know whether some of you played this kind of riddle before, uh, and I don't know whether the young one recognized this. Uh, it was one of those riddle pictures that my teacher liked to show us when we were young. So here's the first picture. Can I have the first picture? Okay, question. So what do you see? Anyone? A... Bus, a vase. Ah, whoa, wow, very fast. Who say a, 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 a vase, a vase or a cup? A cup of a vase. Okay, there's, there's really another picture and she rightly pointed out it's actually two faces face, facing each other, right? Same picture, what's the difference? Different perspective. Same picture, different perspective. Let me show you another one, more famous one. I think you all know this one. Very famous, this one. You don't know, huh? So, oh, okay. You don't know? Okay, let's play this. Can, can. <laughs> okay, what do you see here? What do you see? Just, just say what you see the, the, when you see it. You see a person? Is it an old, young, a lady, a man? Okay. Okay, so most people will see a young lady. But do you see another one? The other one? What do you see? An old lady, okay? You all know this because you've been, you've been through it, right? Right? That's why you can, right? If you don't, you were like, what in the world is pastor talking about, right? But, but because you, you've been through it, you, you, you saw it before, you played this game before, right? Okay, that's a revelation. Do you see the old lady? Do you see? The... Young man, do you see the old lady? No, huh? Okay, later daddy will Google the, the picture and then play. you can play together. Okay, so if you see, you can see the, the, the old lady. Now, we are all looking at the same picture, but why do we see different things, right? Because we are looking at it from different perspectives. And in so many ways, I think this passage invites us to look at the same event, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, but through the lens of the different groups that were present there. Okay? Now, there are largely three groups that are present as Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. These three groups have their own perspective and agendas, and I will base my main points of the sermon on these three groups, okay? So the first one is the perspective of the Pharisees. The second one is the perspective of Jesus' followers. And the third one is the perspective of the crowd. Now, what is the perspective of the Pharisees when they saw Jesus coming in through the gate with the crowd shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which literally means save us, or save now, or if you combine it, then is save us now, not tomorrow, okay, not the other. Save us now, that's how desperate they are, save us now, okay? Simply say, the Pharisees, when they look at this, okay, they were boiling because they had had it up to here, and this event, this particular one, this event, is what I call when the straw that broke the camel's back. It is a straw that broke the camel's back, okay? Now, now, before this event, the Pharisees were irritated, they were angered, and they were disturbed by Jesus. Not only because Jesus said some really blasphemous statement, according to them, huh? blasphemous statements statement such as, my father and I are one, okay? Things like that are blasphemous to them because we worship one God. There is no, uh, God doesn't have a son, you know? Uh, and for Jesus to call God the Father is blasphemous, right? But not only because of that, but it is also because Jesus exposed the hypocrisy 
of the Pharisees for all to see, right? And we've been through it a few weeks ago when I preached about authentic spirituality. What makes Jesus so mad about the Pharisees? Not, is not because they are legalistic, not just that. Of course, they are a, a portion of that. But what makes Jesus to be so mad with the Pharisees is because they are hypocrites. They are hypocrites. They are one thing on the outside, but they are another thing on the inside, right? And because of that, they have now moved from being irritated to contemplating murder, and they want to kill Jesus. But you might ask, hey, pastor, you know, that's a bit harsh, you know? Like, you got proof or not? Where does he say that they want to kill Jesus? Well, it is written there, just a few verses before the passage that we are reading today. So we are reading today from verse 12. Remember John 12, huh? John 12, 12. And this is what it says in verse 9 to 11. Okay, two verses before that. And this is what it says, okay? It says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Okay, so a large crowd took come because Jesus raised a person from the dead. They're like, oh, what in the world is going on? Right? That's kind of almost impossible, right? Maybe uh, water into wine, Okay, some magic trick, but this one is amazing, okay? Okay, so what does it say in verse 10? So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. As well as who? As well as Jesus, lah. okay? Plan to kill Lazarus as well as Jesus. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So basically, there's a large crowd now gravitating towards Jesus and the Pharisees are like, oh, man, I'm losing power here. So it is clear in this passage and also in verse 19, if you can flash verse 19, and it says this in verse 19, so, so, so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. So it's clear that the main reason why the Pharisee wanted to kill Jesus was not so much because Jesus was blasphemous, but rather, it is because the Pharisees are losing power and influence to Jesus. After all, the, mesh, uh, the, the, the crowd shouted, Hosanna, to who? Is it to the Pharisee? It should be to them, right? Because they are the religious leaders. But the crowd shouted, Hosanna, not to the Pharisee, but to Jesus, a son of a, camp, a carpenter in their eyes. Right? They're like, how is this possible? So in other words, Jesus have gotten more popular than the Pharisee. And that, my friend, is bad for business. Okay? In their eyes, it's bad for business. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus has always been and will always be a political tool for the Pharisees to be used and to be kept under control. But the moment they realized that they could not do so, the only option to uh, for him is to get rid of Jesus by killing him. And therefore, Jesus is right when he called the Pharisee hypocrites. Because on one hand, they insisted on the holiness of the temple. But on the other hand, they let it turn into a den of thieves. On one hand, they are so strict in their food laws. But on the other hand, they have neglected the widows and the orphans. And on one hand, they claim to follow strictly the Ten Commandments, which consisted of the sixth commandment of do not murder. But on the other hand, they are plotting murder for the person that they are afraid of or they don't like. That's the perspective of the first group. Let us now move on to the perspective of another group. But there's another group that's present as Jesus entered into Jerusalem, and they are followers of Jesus. Now, to be clear, to be clear, when I say followers, what I meant is not only the 12 disciples, but also the bigger group of followers. Now, if you read the Bible, there are also the 70 that's recorded in the book of Luke and beyond, okay? Now, if you ask me, because of what happened to Lazarus, which is like earth-shaking kind of event, okay? What happened to Lazarus? Jesus became more and more popular. And because of that, those people who follow Jesus sometimes are not his real followers. They are merely fans of Jesus, they're like fans. They're like, oh man, what are you going to do next? They're so cool, right? And this is what I mean by followers, okay? Now, uh, so what is the perspective of this group? Now, frankly speaking, this is the group that have seen the miracles that Jesus had done. They've seen it. They have seen Jesus raise a dead man to life, Lazarus. They have heard of Jesus' teaching. 
and they believe that Jesus is indeed the Messiah and Jesus indeed have the power to overthrow the Roman Empire and to rule over Israel. So can you imagine the anticipation of the followers of Jesus as Jesus entered into the gate of Jerusalem, the Golden Gate? And then, right, when Jesus arrived, to their surprise, he was riding not on a mighty horse, but he was riding on a donkey. Can you imagine the surprise? They were like, what? Why is he riding on a donkey? Let me tell you this. Um, you know, many years ago when I was uh, serving at Changi Methodist Church, uh, what we used to do is we used to run some enrichment programs uh, for the neighborhood schools, right? And we will sometimes use the school hall for our program. And I remember in one of the school hall, uh, the school that we are reaching out to, uh, I was really fascinated by this gigantic fan that is right on top of the ceiling. Can you show the, the picture of the fan first? Yeah, okay, just stop there. Stop there until a little, okay? This gigantic fan that is uh, uh, right on top of the ceiling, okay? Now, this was many years ago. I know that you'll see these fans everywhere now, right? Okay, uh, I live at North, uh, in Pongo, North Shore, and our mall is not like a real mall, they are like mall, so we have fans instead of aircon, okay? And this is the fans that they are used, they use for the, uh, for the malls, okay? So you see this fan everywhere. But that was the first time I saw this fan, okay? So I was like, whoa. And, but what caught my eye uh, the most is that there's a logo attached to the fan. And at that time, the logo is attached to the fan, okay? And it simply say, uh, don't click it, uh, and, and it simply say B-A-F, okay? B-A-F. And then there's a picture of a donkey beside it. So there's a B-A-F and a picture of the donkey, right? So I went to ask my, one of the teachers, uh, hey, you know, what does, what does B-A-F stand for? And then he giggled and he says, B-A-F stands for Big Ass Fans. <laughs> and I thought he's joking. So I Google it. He's not joking. It is, it is big ass fans. <laughs> so whenever you go to the, all the big, big fans uh, you see on the mall or whatever, right? Schools are your schools. Okay, kids, you see your school fans, right? Got this logo, right? Okay, you know what's the stand for? It's big ass fans, okay? And then a picture of a donkey. So what's my point? I do have a point, okay? What's my point? <laughs> my point is this. Donkey is indeed, okay? Pardon my French. An ass of an animal. An ass of an animal, okay? I, I didn't say the ass of the animal. I say an ass of an animal. Okay, that's why the other word for donkey is ass. Why? Because it is dumb. It is slow. It is slowly, but, but it is obedient. Now, I know that there are some who think that donkey is a symbol of peace. And that's why Jesus was riding on a donkey. I beg to slightly differ, just a little bit, okay? But we can talk about it. Not a deal breaker, not a canon event, okay? So we, we can discuss. I slightly differ. Because for me, if you ask me, the symbol of peace is always the dove and not donkey, all right? Anyway, anyway, okay? No matter what your thoughts are, one thing that I hope that we can agree on is this. A donkey is not a steed of a king, but a steed of a servant. Okay? Can I get an amen, amen at least for that? Amen? It's a steed of a servant, not a king. Right? If you're riding on a donkey, then your mission is certainly not to rule, but it is to serve. That is clear. And that is why when Jesus came in on a donkey, they're like, wow! You're not going to rule? You're not going to be king. You're going to serve. Right? And they're like... And that is why it was recorded in Revelation 19.11. That at the second coming of Christ, Jesus will come not on a donkey, but on a horse. Why? Because when he come again the second time, he will be the king of kings, king of all, and not a servant. He was a servant here but not when he comes again. That's why. That's why he was riding on a horse, because he will be king. Now, let me address this real quick, because I know that some of you have another question. And you say that, but pastor, what are you talking about? It's very clear what? Jesus riding on a donkey is a fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. 9. 
Surely the followers know that. And then when they see Jesus coming on a donkey, they're like, ah, oh, yeah, Zechariah 9.9, right? Well, the answer to your question is, no, they didn't know that. They did not know that. Not what not I say, what, uh, Bible said, right? Because it was written in verse 16, this is what it says. Verse 16, in response to verse 15, which was when Jesus was riding on the donkey, and then this was what it says in verse 16. It says, at first his disciple, what? Did not understand all this. Only when Jesus was glorified, did they realize that these things have been written about him, that these things have been done to him. Only after. They realized after the fact. So when they see Jesus coming on donkey, okay, so maybe the 12 disciples, they roughly, but even so, right? But for the mass followers, the 70, the bigger group, when they see Jesus right now, they're like, they didn't know what it means. They thought like, oh man, Jesus come, it's a clear message, Jesus is not coming to fight a war, right? So imagine the disappointment of Jesus' followers when Jesus came not on a horse but a donkey, because they wanted a king, not a servant. So what we have here, brothers and sisters in Christ, is acknowledgement of power that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messiah and have the power to overthrow the Roman Empire. Acknowledgement of power, but a difference on how to use that power. You see where I'm coming from? Basically, we, I acknowledge that you are powerful. I know that for sure that you are powerful, but we have a difference of how to use your power, Right? It's basically like, you know, I don't know, like marrying someone not for love but for, for money. Basically, they just want the power. Like they just want Jesus' power. They're like, Jesus, use that power. Right? And that's, that's the thing. So the, fol the followers wanted Jesus of a certain kind, but they are disappointed when Jesus refused to do so. They wanted Jesus to come and rule. But Jesus riding on a donkey has sent a clear message. I come to serve, okay, and not to rule. I come to serve and not to be served. That's the second group, perspective of Jesus' followers. Let me just move on to the third group, the perspective of the crowd. Uh, let me move on real quick. Then this is my last point, supposedly last point, huh? with the perspective of the crowd. And I noticed this when I read the account of the other Gospels. There are four Gospels that depicted this account. And as I read Matthew uh, uh, chapter 21, verse 10 to 11, and it said this, and it kind of piqued my interest. I didn't notice that it was there before. But when I read this, I realized that, oh, wow, I didn't notice that. Okay? And this is what it says in Matthew 21, 10 to 11. It says this, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred okay, and asked, who is this? Okay? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophets from Nazareth in Galilee. Right? So, because of that, I noticed that beside the Pharisees, beside Jesus' uh, uh, disciples, Jesus' followers, Jesus' fans, there's actually another group, right? There was like walking around, there was present, and then they see a big commotion, they heard about Jesus, and then they ask, who is this? Who is this? Right? So, basically, this is the group that just come about because they, they, because they want to, like, like, you know, the Chinese say they want to chora now. Huh? Like, wow, well, how come uh, like, uh, a big crowd there? Right? And then they follow, like just, just, just how Singaporeans like to follow uh, long queues, right? The, as long as you see long queues, like, oh, I've got to follow, you know, that kind of thing. Right? But actually, yeah, true story, true story, okay? Let me tell you this, okay? Uh, there was once, I, I just stepped into a hawker center and I said that I don't care what I eat, but I'm just going to follow the longest line, okay? Longest line in the hawker center, okay? So I saw the longest line and it was so long that I couldn't, I couldn't see uh, the, 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 the signboard of the, of, of, the, of the stall. So I don't know what they're selling, lah, basically. Lah. So I just follow lah, blindly, you know. I go and queue, 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 right? And I queue for five, a good five to seven minutes. And I keep thinking, no matter what I eat, it's going to be good. And then, right, when we reach and when I can see what they're selling, uh, they are saying, huh? They are selling law me. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. How many of you love law me here? <laughs> uh, I think I have offended, like... <laughs> A few people here. But let me tell you this, okay? Law me is not something that I like to take, okay? So now you know, uh, I like chasu pao, I don't like law me, okay? <laughs> so, so the law me can be rated like 11 out of 10. I don't know like, how, how is that possible, but I still wouldn't take it because it's like law me, law. And I was like, oh no. Then I break the queue. Then later, of course, you know, you know my, my, my colleagues say, I, I see, la, you pastor, anyhow queue, right? 
Sometimes we are like that, we anyhow queue, you know. But spiritually, please don't, please don't do that, okay? So basically, in this story, right, there's actually such uh, a person, okay? So there's a group here that say anyhow queue. They anyhow queue, lah. They follow the crowd. And then when they see Jesus, they're like, hey, never seen this guy before. But why is everyone like so excited about him? Why is everyone like, oh, Hosanna, why, why? And because of that, they say, they ask, who is this? Who is this person, right? Now the question is this, what do they see when they see Jesus? Will they be impressed? I don't know. Will they be disappointed? I don't know. Would they eventually follow Jesus? Maybe, I don't know. Or will they join the crowd, shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. But then, right, one week later, they will be in the same crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I don't know the answer. But I do think this. Any encounter with Christ, especially when you are there with Christ, uh, I think it's a life-changing experience. Okay? I do believe that. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm coming to a close already. Actually, my script very long one, like 12 pages, but amazing. It's just, maybe I read too fast. Uh? So, brothers and sisters in Christ, three groups, three perspectives, Three agendas. I want to wrap up this afternoon's sermon by inviting everyone here to think about these three groups, three perspectives, three agendas. I want you to reflect on this even as we are moving into the Holy Week. The week of pain and suffering for Christ who suffered not because he's guilty of anything, but because of your sin and my sin. That's who Jesus is. So let me ask you a few questions. Remember, three groups, three perspectives, three agendas. Let me ask you this question. Do we see ourselves in the three groups that were mentioned? Before you say, no lah, no lah, pastor, I don't. Reflect first. Think about it. Be honest. Have we become like the Pharisees? Maybe we've been in the church for too long, and before we know it, Christianity is all about prestige and status. Do we act differently on the outside and on the inside? I gotta be honest to you, sometimes I do, and I gotta repent for that. Are we portraying a certain image so that we can gain the praise of others, just like the Pharisees did? Do we do that? Are we jealous of others' accomplishment, especially as we see others gravitate to them? Have we become like the Pharisees? Or maybe we have become like Jesus' followers. How many times have we wanted Christ of our own device? We wanted Jesus to heal, and then when he did not, we are disappointed. We wanted Jesus to get our children in a school of our choice, and Jesus to grant us the job that we wanted, but when it did not happen, we doubted him, and we contemplate of leaving him. How often do we do that? Do we really love Christ, or do we, li- do we love the power that comes with Christ? Let me repeat that. Do we really love Christ for who He is or do we want just His power? And when has Jesus became a Santa Claus or a genie for us? Have we become like Jesus' followers? Last questions. And I want to direct this especially if you are here and you're new, somebody invited you, I want to direct the last one to you. Perhaps you are one of those who follow the crowd here. Follow the crowd. It could be your friend, your relative. And as you heard this sermon, you are asking yourself this afternoon, who is this Jesus? I just want to tell you this if you are one of that person. I just want to say that you are here not by accident, not by coincidence. You are here 
because the Holy Spirit has begun his work of prevenient grace in you. So may you find the answer to your questions. And when you do, may it be a life-changing experience for you. So three groups, three perspectives, three agendas. Which one are you? I, now I want to say this. I want to, I should end my sermon here, lah, but I can't. Okay, I can't, okay? Because if I end my sermon, then I wouldn't do it justice. So bear with me, okay? Two more pages. Two more, okay? I cannot end my sermon here because there's one more perspective that is missing from the whole equation. One more perspective. One more, not group, eh? one more perspective. Do you know whose perspective is this? Who are we missing here? And this is the most important one. This is the perspective that made, mattered the most. And the perspective of? Jesus. Perspective of Jesus. So what is Jesus' perspective? Now, Jesus knows very well of his identity and the prophecy about him. He knows very well. Okay? Now, there are prophecy about him that is beyond his control, like to be born in Bethlehem. He cannot, he cannot do anything about it. But this prophecy, this one, he can do something about because he is a fully grown man with choices, right? With power. Okay? So he is at a crossroads, okay? He has a mission to accomplish, and he has a choice. Question is, obey or not to obey? That is the question. Oh, I already said the question. Obey or not to obey? That is the question. Can Jesus do things differently? Yeah, he could run away, or he could do things in another way, okay? I was thinking about it. He could do things like this. He will enter, but not on a donkey. He said, no, 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 I'm not going to enter on a donkey, but on a, ho a horse. Not only that, but will enter with all the hosts of angels and the mind of heaven behind me. Can you imagine what that would look like if he entered like that into Jerusalem? Can you imagine? I mean, he could come in and then he could just look at the Pharisee who is plotting to kill him, and he'll be like, do not play, play, don't play, play. And the Pharisee will be like, uh-uh. Right? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if he come with all the power of heaven and his followers saw that and said, yes, this is exactly what we want. And it will be, they will be happy. And then can you imagine the crowds who look at Jesus like that and like, oh man, for sure, baptize me now, Lord. Right? For sure. Can you imagine that? Right? Everyone is satisfied. But why didn't he do that? He didn't do that. Why? Why? And I was thinking, I was pondering about it. Okay? And I, I found a passage that's just so beautiful and amazing and powerful. And this, is, this has been my passage that I'm holding on to for this, you know, land and the Holy Week that I'm contemplating on, that I can't do, but I want to do, you know, and it's powerful. So instead of answering you why, let Paul answer you in Philippians 2, 6, 8. And this is what Paul says, Jesus being in the very nature of God, that means he has all the power of God. What did, what did he say? He says, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He's a man with power, but he will not use it because he don't want to anyhow use his power. He don't want to use it for selfish reason. He don't want to play play with his power. And that's Jesus. But rather, rather instead of that, which he could, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. One degree low already. Okay? Taking the degree nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, Two steps lower now, okay? Do you see where I'm coming from? God, not only God, but now a servant. But okay, maybe if you're a servant, God, that's fine. But no, no, no. Now you're a servant, human. That's like, whoa, whoa. I got demoted too quickly now. It's a bit scary, right? But not only that, right? Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself more more, lower, lower, right? By becoming obedient to death. Wow! There's another step down already. 
God, servant, human, now death. But it's not even the honourable death, you see. It's not, it's a humiliating death. It is death on a cross. How many levels down is that? God, servant, human, death, embarrassing, painful, excruciating, humiliating death. That's Jesus. So against all odds, Jesus went into Jerusalem to set in motion his way to Calvary. Against all odds, to suffer and to die for us. He knew, as he entered, right, he knew. This, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not triumphant entry. You know what this is? Death march. Is a death march. This is dead man walking. Dead man walking. But he did it anyway. Why? Let me tell you why. Love and obedience. Love. He loved and he obeyed. And through this, we get to see that indeed this, the God that we worship is our God. This is our God. Who is he? He is a servant king. He's our God, the servant king. Because he came to serve and not to be served. And he gave his life so we might live. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Well, Father God, I indeed thank you. Thank you for, for what you have done for us. Though we are not worthy, Lord, but Lord, you love us so much. And Lord, through your word today, Lord, may we be awakened, Lord, to the things of you one more time. May the Holy Spirit, Lord, speak into our life. May we not only understand the passion of Christ, but we experience you in a very real way. We thank you because you are our God. You are the servant king. And you laid down your life so that we might live. Thank you, Lord. For we pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.